All right, welcome to the June 29th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, I'm going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is going through as expected. All right, welcome to the June 29th, 20. All right, so looks like we got uh, audio going through. If my audio does drop out, which it's done a couple of times recently, just a uh, uh, Feel free to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de so I could reset the audio settings. I appreciate people letting me know. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the Club Cubase live stream. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist based on primarily focusing on Steinberg products. Um, and I'm based in the United States outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, if you are watching this Hangout Live, uh, make sure you drop a little line, tell us who you are and where you're from. Do a quick introduction. It's always fascinating to see people from all over the world uh, able to, to join the Hangout. And if, you, if this is your first live stream, let us know if, that, if it is your first live stream as well. Uh, and... Um, so if you, and for those who have not attended a live stream, how it works is you could submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or you could simply ask in the chat field. We'll try to go through as many questions as we can in our allotted time, and we'll go through them chronologically. If uh, people's ability to ask questions will exceed my ability to actually answer them in a timely, real-time manner, so it, it may take me a while to catch up. So if we could try to avoid uh, asking the same question repeatedly, just because maybe you didn't get an immediate response, that would be appreciated. Also, when asking a question, <clears throat> if you could share like which version of Cubase you're on and which operating system, that information is helpful in, in, in answering questions as well. Um, so today, since it is the last live stream of the month, we will be doing a Zoom meetup. So if you want to, uh, I'll go ahead and post a link kind of throughout the live stream here. But if you want, and this is a great way where we could actually meet each other. So, and someone else could talk besides me. Um, so it, I think they're, they've been really super enjoyable. I just posted a link to it. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll post those throughout kind of the live stream today. Uh, some other things to note is, you know, during our live stream, my family is at home. So my wife is working directly above me. Uh, my son is at summer camp, but maybe coming home in the middle of the live stream. So I'll apologize if there's any interruptions of stuff I may have to do for my son. Uh, so I'll apologize in advance for that, but we'll try to keep all uh, distractions kind of um, as minimized as possible. So, and um, just I want to give a quick shout out to a couple people that help with uh, putting on the live stream. So we have, if you wanted to search for topics, any of the topics that we cover in today's live stream, uh, you will see an index with timestamps pinned to the top of the comments field. Uh, so you can look there. But if you wanted to search for topics on any of the previous live streams, Jan from CubaseIndex.com has created a website. So if you go to CubaseIndex.com, you could search and see if we've covered a particular topic. Um, one other s valuable resource of information that we have for members of the Steinberg community is going to be, uh, you know, in addition to the official Steinberg, uh, you know, options will be the Cubase Nation Discord. So I know Jazz Dude does a lot of work uh, in kind of collecting uh, all of that information. That's a great resource for Cubase users. Uh, and Jazz Dude also serves as one of the two moderators on the live stream. So him and Agent K. So I want to give a, a quick shout out to all those people for their support and for their efforts uh, during the live stream. So we'll go for about two hours today and then do the Zoom meetup. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so we have a question. Um, how can I record the master channel's output into another audio track in Cubase the way I... That way I can have a quick print of all the instruments playing that I can use in a sampler or chop up, et cetera. 
So what a lot of people will do in this case is kind of take all of the tracks here and I will just kind of select all these tracks and then we could send it to a group track. So we'll make a stereo group track. So now as we're kind of playing, this is all being sent. And I will just do that one more time to show one other quick option. So I'm gonna select all these tracks and I'm going to add a group track to the selected track. So now when we do this, this will route all those particular tracks to this group. So if I now wanted to just create a stereo track, what I could do is, you know, like a record, a print track. At this point I could, I will come over here, let's add a stereo audio track. Um, and then, you know, I could actually set its input from the group. So as we go to uh, record, that will then kind of print uh, the everything that's going into this particular group. Um, another way you could do that, but that doesn't necessarily capture the master fader out since that's kind of the very last part of the signal chain. And if that was important to capture, maybe processing on the stereo out, I would select the parts, hit the letter P, and this would set the left and right locators. And at this point, we would just go to export audio mix down. And as we do our export audio mix down, I could just say, okay, we want a stereo out. We'll give it a name, so we'll say bike mix. Um, and I'm going to, after export, I'm just gonna create an audio track and then we're gonna add this to a queue and I'll say start to queue export and faster than real time, um, you know, so speed is important to your workflow, which it is for most people instead of having to listen to it in real time and re-record. Everything has now been kind of captured directly here as our stereo audio file. So in that that way you could do the mix down directly, you know, and export it. So once again, go to your file menu to export uh, and do your audio mix down. And after export, you'll see an option for create audio track. And that would give you kind of all the processing and then you could do further uh, sample editing manipulation directly into there. Okay, so we have a question from Mark. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, new PC with the Ryzen 9 5950X. I have big latency, so I can't play keyboard in real time. Uh, sound card's a UA Apollo twin quad. Uh, studio setup input latency, 3.3 milliseconds. Output latency, two um as you guard on off buffer 64 what is wrong please thank you mark so you know latency is not only going to be uh brought by the buffer size there's other things that could contribute to latency so let's say if i have an instrument track here and i just want it to I'll just do a little kind of piano type sound so let me just add my Hagen Sonic SE and I'll just add a quick piano patch and I'll try to hit my controller keyboard hard where we could see it. So let's say if I hit just with my mouse, that the latency I have isn't bad and that's gonna be kind of contingent upon the buffer size. Now, once we introduce effects, into let's say our master bus or if we have something like a room correction like sonar works those every one of those effects will introduce latency so if i wanted to go to a multi-band compressor and let's add let's say just for demonstration purposes i'll add two multi-band compressors Okay, so now when we look at this, we could actually, you know, when I play note, that uh, I will arm the track. 
that we have a significant amount of latency that's just being caused. Uh, so if I click on a note here on a keyboard, we could see this delay. And this delay could actually be if we go into our large mix console view. So let's say if I just come over here, we could actually see and enable something called your channel latency. And this would actually show the latency of every single channel. So here we can see that I've on my master bus because I have plugins instantiated there, inserted there, that that's going to be a hundred, you know, two hundred and forty-six point one milliseconds of latency just because of those plugins. So this can make you know playing in. in you know like annoying so it's not anything to do with the buffer so it's kind of adding to the buffer now a quick fix for this is to kind of bypass all those plugins is you have on the bottom left hand corner a constrained delay compensation and what that will do is once we go over here uh, so i see these two latent plugins and if i turn on the constrained delay compensation that will bypass any plugin that is causing latency. So it'll just temporarily bypass it. So you can think of it as like a live mode. So if I play now and turn this on, now the latency, basically it bypasses the plugins that cause the latency issue. So it's probably gonna be other software plugins that are causing the latency. And as Cubase plays in real time, um, you know, it compensates, but it can't compensate you know, for real time on input for playing. So that's probably what it is. So I would try just to uh, enable the constrained delay compensation. I think that will solve it for you. Okay. All right, so we see Uno Memento from Finland. Great to see you. And Filter Freak is able to make it, and Jazz Dude and John Costigan from Kenosha. We have Jan from uh, CubaseIndex.com. All right, we have Glenn from Suffolk, Virginia, and Taylor from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, so we see Taylor's question missed from the last Hangout. Is there a way to use the project logical editor to arrange selected tracks and or folders in alphabetical order? I don't know of one, but let's take a look, Taylor, and see if we could... So generally... Um, See if we choose to select. Because I don't know a way that the project logical editor moves tracks based on that. Um, so we could do kind of name, we could do equal or contains or does or contains not as criteria, but we don't have uh, a function for sorting by alphabet. Um, so I don't think it's possible to do that, Taylor, because these are kind of the only criteria for defining kind of the filter target is kind of name is equal or contains or contains not, but not necessarily starts with, or a way to kind of sort them, sort the tracks alphabetically. All right. We have uh, Brian Sawyer from Crystal Coast, North, North Carolina. The Artanon, I think I said that wrong. He spelled it for me phonetically once, and I'm sure I mispronounced it, but glad to see you again. <clears throat> All right, and we have uh, Harpinder Singh from Baltimore, so not far from me. All 
Okay, so we have a question. How do you get the chord track to record what it is playing? Uh, I can get the instrument to play the chords and arpeggiate, but I cannot get it to record what it's doing. Um, all right, so let's take a look. I'll just open up in our project here. Okay, so let's say I have a chord track here. I'll just put in a quick chord progression. Okay, and I think I have electric piano part I'll put up next to it okay so it says how do you get the record track to record what it is playing uh, I can get an instrument to play the chords and arpeggiate but I cannot get it to record what it's doing so I think you know if what you're what let's say if I just have a particular let me just create a quick part here. So I don't think it actually, let's see if I understand Brian's question. So I'll just enter in a couple quick notes here. Okay, and let's put this to whole notes. And let's just say, Okay, so let's say I just have some kind of nonsensical chords. So, and these aren't following, let's say if I enable my chord track, we can see that uh, these aren't necessarily following the chords. So I think that if you wanted to, if I'm understanding your question correctly, uh, Brian, is maybe you want to have, you know, like these might be, uh, can kind of follow the chords but if we just go into um let's say the chord track itself so let's say if i wanted to just go to so we see these notes and i'll just make the so we see like our chords and we can see these notes but now if I go to chords and we could just choose for this to follow the chord track. So I could say, let's just follow the chords. And then we could say follow directly. And then that will automatically shift the particular chord voices to follow the chord tracks. Um, so let me know if that makes kind of sense uh, what you want to do. Um, so if that is kind of what you want to accomplish in the end. Okay, so we have um, a question from Harpenter Singh, how to easily tune drum samples to key? It's a great question. So let's jump over um, to make, we'll try this track here. Okay, so let's say I just wanted to kind of find, uh, so I'll just take a look at this part and let's say I'll just get a very audio and I just want to figure out like roughly what key we're in here. All right, so we'll say we're roughly in, uh, looks like, like G flat. Okay, so let's come over here to, all right, so let's say as we want to, we'll zoom in, so let's say I just want my kick to be kind of in tune 
with the actual event. So we're in A flat or G sharp. So what I could do now is I wanted to take like my kick drum and let's figure out kind of what the tuning is, the pitch of this kick drum. Okay, so I will just kind of isolate. All right, and we have some tracks that are bleeding through. So let's say, Let's just turn on the... All right, so here we can see our kick is tuned to E. So once I kind of know what the pitch of that particular drum is, and I, if I wanted to be in the same uh, tuning of the other track, I could just come right over here and I could select this particular track and you'll see transpose, and then you could just And then you, you could actually just kind of listen to it if you wanted to. You know, so let's say, okay, I wanted to at this point say, okay, this is the original kick and I wanted to listen to it with bass. And then you could just kind of tune directly there. Many people will also just kind of take uh, a particular sample and drag it into the sampler track and then be able to have the sampler track and have that MIDI track follow a chord track if you have one. And that way the pitch can automatically change based on the chords as well. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I, I got a question about uplifting sound effects. What instruments do you recommend me or some sample packs? Um, so I'm not, uplifting could be a lot of different meanings, uh, but you know, some, you know, something that could be kind of interesting is uh, maybe like the noir uh, sound set. I think if you do this type of like cinematic type stuff where maybe you're it's done by Robert Dudzik who's an amazing sound designer where he'll build up kind of these So there's different kind of atmospheres, you know, kind of this, you know, sounds you hear in trailers or very Hans Zimmer-esque. Uh, also just, you know, it's a different kind of sound design stuff. Then you'll have drops. impacts you know so um, but if you could maybe give a little more information uh, as to you know if it's emotionally uplifting or dynamically up uplifting that that could help a little bit but yeah definitely definitely check out the noir uh, and any stuff that Robert Dudzik does is pretty amazing, I think. All right, so we see people wanting to zoom link. So uh, you see Jazz Dudes on it. So you could definitely do that. All right, and great to see Matt Elston on the live stream. 
from London. All right, and occasionally my chat field will um, and I'll have to kind of find my place again. Okay, so we have a question. Hello, when I export a piece of music, I lose volume and or the final mix sounds softer than what is originally in is in the Cubase software. Thank you. So a lot of times that could be kind of the result of, you know, how gain structure could be set within the particular project. So many times when people are using uh, like powered speakers, it's easy to maybe um, so say if I have this as a project, and I see my loudness, but let's say I have my master fader down and I have the volume of my monitor speakers cranked up that now when I go, let's say, so let's compensate for this. So let's say I want to make my control room louder. So now when I go to export audio mix down and we'll go ahead and put this directly back into, um, we'll create an audio track here and we'll just basically export it directly in that as we do this, we can see that the amplitude here of this file won't be as loud because the master volume, the master fader was down. Because then basically as you're doing this, if, it's, if the master fader is attenuated here for monitoring purposes, and this is kind of one, main, one of the main reasons that you would utilize the control room. But if that's down, now I'll, I'll export the same file with the master fader at around zero dB. So let's go ahead and export and we should probably just take a look and you'll see visually kind of what's going on. So I'll go ahead and let's add that to the queue. And we'll export this particular file. And you can see that it's the same file, but just the master fader uh, being up can make a huge difference in the overall amplitude or the loudness of the particular track. So, you know, make sure that the gain structure of your mix is set up where your master fader, you know, hovers near zero dB. And then when you export, you'll get kind of, you know, something that's kind of in the same ballpark loudness wise. Okay, uh, so we see uh, from Jeff Sabelski, great to see you on the live stream. Uh, to print a, bass a bassoon part that starts uh, 181st measure score will give the option of pages but not measures. Uh, is there a workaround for printing measures because the bassoon part is killer? All right, so let's come over here. Let's take a look. Um, let's find, let's take like a Bach piece here where we'll have some length. Let me just take another piece where we have different parts going in and out. It might utilize this a little better. Here we go. I'll take this Schubert piece. Okay, so in this in this project, we're gonna have parts that go in and out. Um, so let's say here my flute 
like this flute part, uh, let's say, you know, like your bassoon may not come in till measure, you know, 88. So if I just select this particular part in the score editor, um, you know, so just selecting that particular part, we could see, um, you know, just that part that's selected is not going to print out, um, you know, all measures before. Um, so, you know, try to maybe, you know, if you have blank parts, maybe just select, like, so say if I go to the bassoon part here, we go to the score editor, um, and I look at it, that we could see the bassoon part, and it's not going to print out, like, you know, 15 pages of no measures. Um, and something else that you could do also to kind of alleviate that if you do run into issues, Jeff is, I think, let's see if I remember how to do this. Um, but you could have uh, consolidated rests as well. Okay, so say uh, multi-bar rests. So now you could just kind of look at it also and say, okay, 86 bars of rest, and then you come in right here. So if you just kind of come over to um, see where we where were we? so let's say so you could activate the multi rest uh, in the project in no, under notation style so you'll see for multi bar rest and then just going to layout um, then. You could just say, you know, more than three measures, just activate a multi-bar rest so you don't print out pages and pages of, uh, you know, rests unnecessarily just to annoy the musician. All right, uh, so we have a question. Can you show us how to change the articulation in a MIDI note? Um, so if you wanted to, let's say, change the articulation for a particular instrument here, so let's say I'll take uh, a violin. So it's So let's say I wanted to, like I have these set to legato. So I'm gonna go in the, instead of looking at velocity here, I could just look at articulations and dynamics. So if I wanna change the articulation on those notes, I can Come right over here, say I want those to be more spiccato. And I'll just take my snap off. So you can put spiccato and then go back to legato. So this will change. So even then if I wanted to Say, let's just select these particular notes. Uh, and I wanted these notes to be pits. I could come right in here and go back to legato. So that's how you could change articulations on individual notes. All right, so we have P Zone, P Zone checking in from uh, Gloucester, UK, and Molly Frank from Norway. Thanks for joining us.
so I just see will it be possible to have both a peak and RMS meter for tracks uh, in future update. So let's say if we are taking a look at it. So, you know, on a track level, you know, if you just wanted to um, go to some of the meter settings, so, you know, you could, um, so let's just come here to our global meter settings. So you could, you know, choose to kind of hold, uh, you know, the you could choose different meter positions, but you could also choose to hold the peaks uh, forever if you wanted to. And then, you know, once you're in the meter here in the control room, you could have different options, but I think it's just limited to what I showed on the, uh, on the actual, uh, on the actual track meters, but I'll pass that along as a concept. Okay, so we just see feature request from uh, Taylor, a uh, macro for sorting selected tracks, groups, or folders alphabetically. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass that along as well. So, um, and if you, Taylor, if you had the option, maybe if you could leave a comment if it was okay, if it was done numerically as well, or if it was handled numerically. Um, so, or if that makes more sense, maybe doing your, um, you know, doing it numerically versus alphabetically. All right. So we have hot mess on the live stream and he wants to everyone to sink their teeth into that like button. So if you hit the like button, if you learn something new, uh, or just want to be able to support the live stream that allows us to continue to do these, uh, live streams at free of charge. So at no cost to people. Uh, so I just see a question, is it possible to alphabetically sort plugins in the plugin manager? So I think depending, uh, when we look at it, if, if, if the VST three plugins have like categories designed that they'll be kind of organized alphabetically. So let's go to our VST plugin manager. Um, so as we see in the VST plugin manager that we have these kind of already, uh, sorted alphabetically, but you know, so you could make your own plugin collection. Um, so here, you know, we could take our plugin collection and kind of sort by category or vendor, which may be more practical. Um, but if you want it to, you know, you could just see everything here and drag it over. So let's say if we do a new collection, um, so I'll just say, we'll make a new empty collection. All right, and let's say if I just get to my VST effects here and drag. Sorry, I'll just make a. So if I just drag those over, then they'll all be kind of uh, alphabetized in your own collection. So uh, let me know if that makes sense. All right. Okay, so question from uh, Jeff Sabelski. Greg, I like uh, Chord Track does to 
I like chord track does to more than one track. How can I get multiple uses at once for it or need to record on each track? Uh, and will it rewrite notes of the melody? Um, so, you know, you could choose to have, you know, the MIDI parts follow the chords or not, you know, so you could, you know, so let's say we add uh, instrument track here. Let me just go back to my plugin collections to You know, so here, once you have, you know, for every single track, you could choose for it to follow the chord track or not. Um, so it says, I like the chord track does to more than one track. How can I get to, to multiple uses at once for it? Or I need to record each track and will overwrite notes in the melody. Um, you know, so if you're doing live input, you know, so, you know, if it's once, so if you have MIDI data, you could have, you know, once you select the chords, you could have it, you know, follow the chords or scales. Um, and, you know, if you don't want it to do that, you could just simply, uh, you know, like if you want to do for bass, you could just choose for it to follow root notes. Um but there's also kind of the live input mode, so where you could just have it automatically go to whatever the master scale is or to the chord, so you can't play out of it. Uh, but you should, you know, you can have multiple tracks set up all independently. Okay, so we have a question. How do I find the tempo for a vocal when doing a mix with unknown BPM? Really, all you have to do is, and this could vary depending on a particular file. You know, the first thing I would try is go to your project menu and just do a quick tempo detection. So you could just kind of select a file and Cubase can do analysis of the tempo. Uh, but if the file is something that's not very kind of rhythmically stable, what you may need to do is just, you could select what we call the, the time warp tool. And let, so let's say, um, like if I have like this, um, this might be, you know, and you can say, okay, this is like, you know, the downbeat. And once we have the time warp tool, what this is going to allow us to do is we could say, okay, measure 42 is here. Measure, this is the next downbeat. And you could manually just kind of move uh, tracks if necessary. So you could say, this is right where measure 48 starts and measure 49 is right at that. And 50 is there, 51 is, and you could just manually move. And as you do that, that's inserting a new tempo every time that you move kind of with the time warp. So select the time warp tool and then just simply come over here and move the tempo to fit kind of where, where the downbeat is in the vocal. And that will give you uh, a, a tempo track based upon that. All right, thanks for all the wonderful questions. All right, just scrolling back to. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to combine three or more MIDI tracks to one audio track? Example, I have a violin with three different MIDI articulations and I want to bounce them all to one audio track during my session. So yeah, there's, there's a number of different ways of doing that. So one, is if they're all set to kind of the same group, uh, you could do that quite easily, but let's go back to maybe our Schubert piece here. So, and let's say I wanted to combine all of my strings here. Um, so let me just, I'll just go ahead and select these different parts. Um, and what I could do is just come over here 
I'll activate the project. That would help. I hate when it's user error on my part. So let's come over here and let's go to render in place. So I'll just say, so I just have, all right, so I'll abort this because I'll go. To, I'll show you something in the render in place settings first that would be helpful. So I could say I just wanted to take these and I'll choose not dry but channel settings and then I could choose to mix down to one audio file. So now I could just choose render and that will take all my strings, all of the selected events here and automatically render it down to one uh, particular audio file. Of course I picked like a 20 minute piece but that would just do that for you. So I'll just do a quick crop of this just to just select this. Let me go to my range and I'll crop that particular part. And let's say we'll just do a quick render in place with those. So we'll get to the render settings. We'll choose mix down to one audio file, hit render. And now all the strings will be rendered uh, as one as one file right there. And it will mute the original parts if that's what you have. You could also choose to disable, but that's a, a quick way of doing that. All right, great to see Mark Rabin on a live stream. All right, so we have a question from Kevin uh, Mehmed. Um, can you show me a large timecode file and try to show how different ways to export at 64-bit and if there is a limit on the size in 64-bit? Um, so, all right. So let's say if I take uh, this particular project here, so let's say this 10 minutes, so say I'll just duplicate this a couple times. Okay. So say, you know, if you're 24, uh, you know, 24 minutes or so. Okay. Um, so say different ways to export at 64 bits. So if you're looking for different ways to export at 64 bit, you can come over here and say you want to do your export audio mix down. And at that we want to choose to be 64 bit float um, and you know, whatever sample rate you want. Um, so, and, but there's no real, you, you may want to, if you're running into, you know, audio file, audio, si, you know, audio file size limitations, Kevin, just try, um, try, I, you might want to try unchecking this, um, uh, you know, but if it's, you know, so if it's a 64 bit float file so there's a good chance that that won't play on other systems there's a lot of you know media players that won't play you know that you know most of them have a hard time playing a 32-bit file but 64-bit but there's no real limitation to the file size i know that um like when i was an engineer and air clapton's crossroads you know we had one rig that was actually recording um you know, we did 17 hour files on, on one rig without any problems. So. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to tap tempo and record the tempo map on Cubase? There's a feature in DP called Conductor Track that lets us do this. Any way to do this on Cubase? So let's go ahead and show you how we could do it. So let's say, um, I'll jump back to 
to this project here so we don't have a tempo map in this. So let's say if I wanted to create uh, a tempo map based on our performance, I could just go to a MIDI track itself. Um, I'll just record. I'm just going to hit one MIDI note as we go along. And let's just say we're going to do quick tap tempo. And I'll just mute. So I'll just kind of tap along, create a MIDI note. So I'm doing this at every beat. So I have an incredibly exciting looking MIDI part like this. So if I wanted to turn that into uh, actual you know, tempo information, all you have to do now is get to MIDI. And under, I think it's under functions, you can say merge tempo from tapping. And we can say I tapped quarter notes and we can be begin at the bar. And now that will automatically create the tempo map for us. It's gonna be kind of locked to that. So we'll just open up a quick tempo track. And you can see that we'll have our tempo track that's gonna fluctuate uh, just depending upon, and I'll activate the tempo track here. So we can see that's kind of the tempo that I just kind of tapped in. So just tap in quarter notes or the downbeat of every measure. And at that point, go to your MIDI menu, go to functions, and you wanna say merge tempo from tapping. All right, we have a question. What is the right way to integrate the VST plugins into the right zone? So, you know, once you have uh, your, you could just come over here. Let's say we go to our media bay. So I click on the media tab and I go home. So here I could see all my VST effects plugins and they'll be organized just like we have it set up in our VST uh, you know, plugin manager. And if I wanted to just come over here, so anything that Cubase is seeing will be visible here. So, okay, if I wanted to now come over and have an instance of pad shop here, I could just drag and drop and load up and that will load the instrument for me so that I could just start playing. And with plugins, I could also just see you know, if I wanted this particular plugin on a track, I could just drop it as an insert. If I go directly in the middle, if I wanted to go at between tracks, I would automatically place it uh, at, and make an effects channel track. Um, but any of the plugins that are visible in your system in the VST plugin manager, which by default will kind of show all the plugins that Cubase is seeing, uh, they will just show up here in the right hand zone, but you could go click on the media and then if you start from home, you can see your VST effects and you could go back, you could go to VST instruments and go back. All right, so we have a question. Um, uh, from Jonas Hanika. Um, hope I said that right. Hanika, maybe. Uh, is it possible to insert silence on an audio event while using the comp tool, or do I have to delete the audio region? Because I slowly delete the entire subtrack when choosing between different takes. Um, so let's take a look at a quick comping scenario. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And once again, in about uh, an hour and five minutes, we'll transition to our Zoom meetup. So maybe if Jazz Dude could uh, post a link one more time. Or Agent K, if you appreciate it. All right, so.
Okay, so if I have multiple uh, events here, so let's say we'll come over and let's say this is my comp track. Okay, so I have multiple takes here. All right, so um, so is it, and the question is, is it possible to insert silence on an audio event while using the comp tool or do I have to delete the audio region? Um, because I slowly delete the entire subtrack when choosing between takes. So you know, there's a couple of ways you could approach this. So let's say if I, I do a quick comp that looks like this. Okay, so you know once we select with the comp tool, the others are automatically muted. So some people I've seen will go through and you know physically mute the tracks. You could do that as well. Um, and it's because, and then it's, I just see, cause I slowly delete the entire subtrack when choosing between takes. So it could, it sounds like maybe if you go to audio editing and if you go to advanced, so let's say if I'm here, uh, let me just select an event here, or you could actually do this in preferences as well, not for your computer, but for Cubase rather, and under editing, where, so you might have, um, I think it's directly under editing of delete overlaps. So check to see if you have delete overlaps active. So, and then as we do uh, comping here, that will just kind of get rid of those parts that are being muted. So if you don't want that behavior, you could just disable delete overlap. So it doesn't necessarily uh, get them, get rid of them on a computer, but kind of tucks them away. So as I come over here, um, now without delete overlaps, but it could also be set if you go to audio to advanced and delete overlaps can be kind of enabled there. So if you want it to, um, so I'm not sure if you need to add silence, um, but maybe you're just deleting overlaps, but you know, once you have everything kind of set up in your comp, you know, the other parts, you know, if you didn't want anything from a particular zone, you know, you could just choose to mute and you could do that kind of across multiple events just by selecting or if you wanted to, you know, toggle the mute status behavior of those, just kind of clicking on it. So if you want to do that for multiple parts, you can mute and unmute like that. So let me know if that helps. Okay, so just see uh, this from our previous question, probably with the master fader. Uh, so it says, thank you, sir. What if my master was already set at zero? So see if you have, you know, with the uh, exported file being low in volume, you know, see if you have any other plugins that are attenuating the signal, um, you know, and it could also be that, you know, if you're doing that and if you're monitoring, you know, make sure that, you know, if you're going into a mixer, maybe the mixer volume is set loud, you know, like your monitoring source or your speakers or the gain structure is set where the gain of the speakers is adding gain so that when you have something that's not adding gain, uh, it sounds like it's lower in volume. So... Those are a couple of things to check out, Mike. All right, so just the question from uh, producer Roderick. Uh, what version are you showing on the screen? So we have Cubase, I'm running Cubase 11.03. Sometimes I have projects that may say, you know, Cubase version seven, like my current project that I have open here, but that's just when that project was uh, was created and saved in. So I've been using this project for a while.
All right. Uh, so we have a question uh, from Ron. Uh, hi, Greg. Appreciate you and Steinberg doing this to help us. I have a question. Is it possible to transfer a Steinberg account and license to another email? Um, generally, I, d I don't deal with that aspect as much. Uh, I'm sure it I'm pretty sure it can be done. If you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. Um, you know, I, I know that I've set this up. Uh, I was helping out Dweezil Zappa and he needed to kind of switch his email address. So I know it's possible, uh, but you may have to reach out to uh, customer support if you create a support request form from your Mike Steinberg account. Um, someone should be able to help you out with that. But if you wanted to email me and tell me what country you're based in, I could probably put you in touch with the correct support department. Okay. All right. So great. Wonderful to see Michael Pierce on the live stream. Okay. So just see uh, from producer Roderick and was like, Hmm, I never seen the Q part on the export. So that was a new, that was new functionality that was introduced in uh, Cubase 11. Um, all right, so we have a uh, question. Any word on M1 Max full integration and Windows 11 compatibility? So I don't think that they've sent out uh, copies for Windows 11 testing. I do have a call later this week where I could uh, maybe get a clarification, I think, on Thursday. On M1 Max, you know, there's a lot of components that may not, like third-party components that may not actually translate to the silicon processor. So, but we are, you know, working fully in uh, with full Rosetta support. All right, wonderful to see Michael Teams on the live stream. Looking forward to seeing his ice cream choices. And if you want to find out how Michael Teens can come up with his creative ice cream flavors, he revealed it in the last Zoom meetup. So there's a teaser for everyone to come join. And Michael Teens is already off give, donating ice cream. All right, so Mark Raven is saying he hit the like button and other people should too. All right, so we have Brianna from Youngstown. Great to see you on the live stream. Um. Okay, so I just see a question. Is there a way to trim pan positions when using uh, CC remote? I cannot get the pan to center when using the Behringer X32. It's always minus two when compared to X32, it's zero. Uh, Cubase 11 Pro, Windows 10. All right, so, uh, so it's probably, you know, so it's, Usually stuff like that, it sounds like maybe, you know, sometimes the faders and knobs on control surfaces, like, and that's what kind of the Behringer X32 is doing, is maybe actually uh, transmitting, you know, sometimes they can need to be calibrated. So I've seen situations like that where the faders and the knobs need to be calibrated for the control aspect of... Uh, so you may want to see if there's a calibration. Uh, if you need it, you know, if you found that it was always uh, minus two, you know, regardless, you know, if it was snapping to that, it might be something, because uh, I think the Behringer X32 is going to be just running under like a Mackie control. So I don't know if there's any particular settings that would do that. It's kind of handled through the Mackie control protocol. 
Um, but you know, there, there's ways that you might be able to within the automation, you know, cause a lot of times that is kind of sending MIDI information, you know, to control the parameter, but it's not actually MIDI information, you know, it's MIDI control, but not anything that can necessarily be edited. Uh, but you may have to just edit the automation, you know, so if it's always, you know, if we're coming and let's say if I just drag a quick loop in here and you know, so you might just have to look at the automation and adjust the automation if the control surface is spitting out the wrong uh, particular value. All right, Michael, uh, Agent K is, is giving everyone a hint. If you hit the thumbs up, you might get free ice cream from Michael Teams. So see comment from... Um, uh, Jeff Sabelski, the round robin effect in Iconica sections and players is unbelievably cool as it ebbs and flows like real musicians, artists, and sometimes better. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with what, what a round robin is when dealing with samples, you know, it basically allows you to, like, as you play the same note repeatedly, it allows you to actually, you know, pick to cycle between different samples. So it's not playing the same sample over and over and over again, sounding a bit unnatural. Okay, so we see that uh, for Taylor Sapp, uh, numerically would work as well as alphabetically for sorting uh, tracks in a project. All right, so we see a question from William Baker. Hi, when reading track mute on and off uh, data during playback, it sometimes lags. Could this be a latency issue? I'm not experiencing notable latency when recording other MIDI data. So it, it could be, uh, you know, sometimes you see if the behavior is different, like if you have a track with no plugins on it, if it if that makes a, a difference in the um, you know the response with that, and also you know try to just out of curiosity, uh, you know just try to come over here and activate the constrained delay compensation and see if you notice a, a change in in the speed of the responsiveness to that. Okay, we have a question. Uh, how do we keep Cubase from automatically populate sends on new audio tracks? I think it is a preference. Um, so let's see. Okay, so try going to your preferences to VST, and then you'll see a preference for connect sends automatically for each newly created channel. Try to uncheck that preference. So once again, uh, to um, just come right over there, just go to VST preferences to VST and uncheck connect sends automatically for each newly created channel. All right, so we just see uh, how to disable slash close the right um, the right column box. So I guess it's, it's, if it's the right zone, you could just see kind of directly here. And there's a keyboard shortcut for it. So I think it's a option or alt plus R. So if you just kind of come right over here So, but you could just see this icon here. So if you want to hide the inspector or the lower zone, you could just click right there to hide the right zone. All 
right, thanks for all the great questions. We hope that everyone is learning a new tip or trick. All right, my chat field just moved on me, so. All right, so we just see from uh, Mandy Lane, we need a stock plugin vocoder for Cubase 12, and I would like to see a new sound font player. Uh, I'll pass those along. So we haven't, um, yeah, so sound fonts, we haven't had much request for that over the years. But uh, if you have Halion, the, the full feature of Halion that will play sound fonts for you. Okay, um, so let's see, uh, this, um, it says I set up a key command, this is a question I think, I'll read through it. Uh, I set up a key command for it and MIDI button on controller and key commands, look up window zones. Yeah, okay. so it's back with our previous discussion. I see Mark Rabin was the latest recipient of Michael Team's virtual ice cream. As well as I see that John Costigan it's got peaches and cream. That's a nice flavor, all right. Okay, so we see from, uh, I think it's Valide Productions. Hi, I'm new here, what's going on? So this is, just a club Cubase live stream. So what we do is you could ask questions on any Steinberg products and we'll try to answer the questions for you so you can get the most out of it and kind of work smarter and better, more efficiently with uh, programs like Cubase and others. And uh, welcome to the live stream. All right, so we see Sesame Inc. Uh, is joining in. So he says, uh, so he's checking and saying hi to everyone. Uh, he says, I usually just listen to grasp something new. So thanks for joining us and for introducing yourself and saying hi. Right. And just for saying hi, you get free ice cream. All right. All right. So a question from Ted Springman uh, for drum pads such as mine that has a velocity dead zones roughly between one through 20 where ghost notes don't play. Can logical editor scale existing MIDI velocity? so that it covers the full range. Um, so it could be that, um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, in a situation like that, Ted, probably what you would um, want to do is actually come over here and you can see like your MIDI modifiers. Um, and at this point you have kind of velocity compression. Um, so I think if you wanted to just put this into kind of a, a positive area, so let's say if you're not getting the full, uh, you know, resolution, you know, try set this, your velocity compression to maybe 125%. Um, and then, you know, that should be able to maybe get the lower notes, um, you know, the lower velocities, you know, that might help. Um, but if, you know, so I'm not sure if it's not actually kind of transmitting, you know, so some, some sample libraries don't have samples from one through 20. So it may not actually kind of have a particular sample that could be set there, but I would try maybe just going to the velocity compression 
And here you can set this for, you know, not only negative values, but for positive values. Uh, and that may be able to kind of, you know, work with particular instruments. And you can see, Ted, if that is with, you know, every instrument or just, you know, uh, you know, with particular instruments as well. But I would look there. Okay. Um, and one other thing, Ted, that you could do is if you, you know, if it's actually, you know, you know, you could see if it's transmitting the notes, like if you look to see when you make that, but maybe the velocity. Um, so if it's transmitting the notes, you could create a logical editor preset to say, okay, let's go to, um, Just go to a logical editor. And you could say, you know, notes that have velocity. So let's say velocity, you know, um, velocity less than 20. Uh, we could take the velocity value two and, you know, multiply by two and then, you know, so any note that has a velocity, but if the controller is not transmitting it, you know, that it's one thing, but it may be transmitting it, but not firing off an instrument to actually sound the particular, um, to not sound a particular instrument. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a real advantage to recording in 64-bit versus 32-bit float? So it could really depend upon your converters. I would say that 64-bit float is uh, convenient if you actually have like a 32-bit word converter. So there's some many of the Steinberg interfaces like our uh, AXR4U, AXR4T, and our URC interfaces. There's URC22, 44, and 816. Those actually have 32-bit analog converters. Like most interfaces, the vast majority have 24-bit converters. Uh, and so, but if you have a 32-bit converter and you're recording uh, and you're capturing in 32-bit with like a high precision driver. So you'll actually see like on a Mac, uh, it'll actually show up. Um, so I go to my UR24C that we could choose uh, for it to be a high precision. This means that's going to actually record a 32-bit word. So if your interface can, can capture a 32-bit word, it can it can help you in sound quality. The vast majority of interfaces don't do that. So. All right. So we see Michael Pierce is competing with uh, a football game in a pub nearby his house. All right, so uh, I see a question from uh, Wheelie Bear Paul. Uh, has anyone been able to get the Korg Legacy cell to work in uh, Cubase 11 Pro? So I've gotten the M1. I have like the Korg M1 in a wave station. And I think a Poly 800 plugin working in my Cubase 11 on my Windows 10 system. All right, so question. Um, all right, and I think we had also just uh, Gregor Hasmiller joined us. So thanks for joining us. I meant to mention that earlier. Uh, all right, so we just see a uh, question. Can you please explain how to randomize velocities while programming drums? So you could, you know, there's a couple of different uh, ways to do it. If you wanted to do it during the programming, um, you know, probably the easiest way is I'll just go to another project here. OK. 
Okay, so let's say if I'm here, you know, as we go to, you know, put in drums, you could actually choose like different velocity amounts here. And these could be uh, set via key commands. So if you wanted to just come here, so let's say, uh, I'll just, Okay, so let's say I was just coming here, say, okay, I wanna put in my kick. And let's say a clap. And let me just put this to quarter notes. All right, and let's say I just want to put in different velocities. You know, so if you click here, you could say, okay, I wanted this velocity to be 50 and I wanted the next one. And there, there is like a, between the four levels of velocities, you could kind of have keyboard shortcuts to put those in. But let's say if I wanted to do it, you know, maybe a little uh, a different approaches after it's been entered in. So I will say I'll just take a bunch of notes here and I wanted to change the velocity on all of these notes is you could just say, okay, this note is an F sharp one. So I could go to the logical editor and at this point I can say, okay, we're going to transform and I want to take note messages. So let's say, um, value one is equal to, let's say F sharp one. And what I want to do is value two, which is a velocity message. I could say, you know, let's set to random values between, let's say 40 and 100. So now when I hit apply, you could just randomize velocities on specific pitches or just on any note. And you could just kind of randomize your velocities like so. All right, so we see Jazz Dude's kind enough to post the Zoom link. So we'll be doing that in about 37 minutes. We'll transfer over. Looking forward to seeing everyone on the Zoom meetup. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Kevin. Uh, what is the advantage of 192K over regular audio sampling like the other than Focusrite Scarlett I own and will sampling get more complicated or work with Apple iTunes or Spotify, which helps? So a lot of the delivery services won't actually transmit a full resolution 192K file. So, you know, I would say most people I know are still kind of working at 44.1 or 48K. Um, or if, you know, they're doing something maybe totally squeaky clean, like a classical piece, or maybe like, you know, think Alison Krauss, kind of Americana acoustic, very pristine. They may go 96 or 192K. So, but, you know, I don't think that you may get many advantages doing 192K if you're, you're going to be on, you know, iTunes or Spotify, you know, I guess they, they are starting to do some lossless audio, uh, but, you know, you may not benefit from it too much. And the processing that it takes to do everything at 192K, you know, the, the impact that it has on your computer's processor may be disadvantaged you know, may, may be a disadvantage uh, in compared to how many tracks you could get on other systems at lower sample rates. All right, so we see that Mark Rabin is going to, instead of going to fly into blimp and watch a bunch of fireworks, that he's actually going to um, join our Zoom meetup. Right. 
Looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Jeff Sabelski. Um, one last thing with core track, I choose the MIDI track, but can't find its routing for volume adjustments uh, from the melody, which I can. It sounds great, but it's perplexing what I don't know. So if if it's a you know a virtual, let's say if, if it's an instrument track, you know you could just come over here and say, okay, you know we go and you can see this volume here. Now, if it's going to be a MIDI track, so let's say if I add track, let me add a MIDI track. I'll do that. Um, but let me, I'll just, let's say I add a virtual instrument here. So I'll, I'll, I'll initiate the sequence uh, from another way. So let's say I go to my VST instrument rack here. And I want to add an instrument rack. So let's say, okay, now I'm going to retro log. So now we have an instrument track that's being routed to a MIDI track that's being routed to a virtual instrument as opposed to an instrument track. So if that's the scenario, you could adjust the volume. Uh, not here, because this will show you your MIDI volume, and it's probably not what you want, but rather you'll see um, just this little tab here where you see almost like the second E, and if you click here on the second one, this will open up the audio characteristics for that particular uh, MIDI track that's being routed to a virtual instrument. Okay, so we have a question uh, from uh, Gregor Hasmiller. Is it possible to save a folder with its content? Uh, the idea is to create all instrument, uh, to create all MIDI tracks for a hardware instrument in one folder and use the folder's instruments depending on which instrument you need. Uh, greetings from Bavaria. So what you could do, it's not necessarily saving a folder, but what you could do, Gregor, is to just select you know, let's say I wanted to select these tracks here, these instrument tracks. Um, you could, there, there's two approaches. One is to just come over and say, okay, I want to save selected tracks. Um, and we could copy media files if we needed to. All right, so now once I do this, I could export the tracks and I'll just call this Gregor and I'll just save it to my desktop. All right, so now I go to a new project, and this could be MIDI or virtual instruments. Okay, so now if I wanted to come here, and, and then I could say, imp, uh, we could say import track archive, and I'll go to my desktop, and I could now just call this up, and here I could just choose to select all of the tracks and everything will be recalled uh, kind of very easily, just like that. So you could have one kind of track archive as your, um, you know, one track archive as, you know, per instrument if you wanted to. Now, if you really needed to do that for, uh, let's say, you know, for a folder, if the folder status is critical to you, you could just come and I'll just add these to a folder. All right. And then I could just save kind of an empty project, if you will. So I'll just come over here. We'll call this Gregor. Okay. And I'll... Right, make sure I have the right path. Uh, and then you could choose to import uh, tracks from project. So let's say we come over here to 
or Hangouts. I think it was June 15th was the folder. Um, and at this point, I could just say, let's import the folder. And that would import that into our project with the folder and everything. So those are two different ways of kind of saving. Um, yeah, and you could also just save those as track presets. So once you come here, you know, say load, say save track preset. Um, and at this point you could, you know, add, uh, you know, add a track using the track preset. Um, so let's just say they're not going to be audio, but I think we could even. Say go to track preset instrument. And then you could just simply save those different things. And I think you could even just come over here. So let's say let's go to user presets, track presets, instruments. And then you could even just kind of drag directly from over there as well. So there's, there's a couple of different approaches. All right, and thanks for joining us from Bavaria. It's part of the world I've always wanted to go to and haven't made it there yet. All right, so a question uh, from Carlos. Uh, Hi, Greg, hope you and your family are well. We're doing great, thank you for asking. Uh, is there any way to resize a split on rows? The transport bar is too wide of my screen. I know I can, uh, I can to select parameters, but I need them all. So if you need more parameters, what I've seen people do is they'll just kind of take like maybe their Cubase project window, maybe make it a little shorter overall and then hit F2. So you have one transport bar that could be um, part kind of tied to the project window and another floating transport bar where you could have other settings. So I've seen people kind of stack their transport bars uh, so they could have two rows of parameters. So and again, just F2 and then you have a floating transport kind of like previous versions of Cubase prior to version 10. Um, Sorry, just keep hitting the wrong key. I'll hit F2 instead of F1. But then you could have that floating transport bar coupled with the one that's at the bottom, and you could see more parameters that way. reading through more. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. And if you learned something new, make sure you hit the like button. All right. Let's see if we get to a hundred likes before we move over to our Zoom meetup. All right, so I uh, just see a comment from Ted Springman. So discussion on drum pads says, uh, I'm afraid the only accurate way to capture drum ghost notes for playback and VSTI drums is to record real drums and do audio to MIDI drum replacement. 
playing on a keyboard won't yield uh, the bounce effect. So, you know, people could get like, you know, it could really depend upon your keyboard controller quite a bit as well. Um, you know, and I've had discussions with a number of composers on, you know, on, you know, particular controllers that are kind of can be more expressive, you know, so, you know, so don't, I think you can do it. I know that I've done it. Uh, in my studio, my main controller is a Roland A80, and that's kind of very responsive to low velocity material as well. So, um, so you can do it with a MIDI controller. There's a lot of MIDI controllers that maybe don't have, you know, like a great, you know, that there's a lot of instruments that don't respond well to like a velocity ramp. And there's a lot of keyboards that, you know, figure that, you know, 98% of the velocity is going to be in this range and they make sure that that works and may not be designed to work for low kind of low velocity thresholds but they, there are controllers definitely out there for that okay so we have a question from Ron is there a way to save my preferences and key commands uh, preset in a flash drive so that when I use another computer I could just load them without setting them up them up manually again thanks yeah so if you go to your edit menu this could be done in your profile manager so just simply come over here uh, you know take your profile and export it to your flash drive you know so once you come over here you can export it directly to whatever drives in your computer and import it onto your second computer reading through more comments and questions Just finding my place. Sorry about that. See, I have lots of questions in my future here. Okay, so I think I'm close to where I was. All right. All right, so you see the Ted Springman's controllers at SPD 30. So also check if you haven't, you know, there's often like velocity control settings in uh, controllers as well, if you haven't done that. Like where you have different scales. Okay, so we have a question from Scott Bogfoot. Hey Greg, can you briefly go over what is located on the top and bottom toolbars in Cubase 11 Pro, thanks. All right, so here we could have uh, your undo, redo for functions. We could activate the project. We have configurations, and this will allow you to store different channel configurations for particular projects with different criteria. Uh, here we could just have kind of global mute solo, read write automation, and also suspend writing of automation. Uh, we have kind of your automation section here, so you could choose which automation your mode or open up your automation control panel. 
this is the view. So as we, I'll just show this very quickly with a particular project. So as we want to have the screen kind of redraw. So if we're playing here, I could choose for it to redraw when it gets to the end, or if I want it to continuously cycle. We could do that. Or just a page scroll. We'll have our tools. So your object selection range, your drawing, eraser, scissors, um, colors. You'll have snap to zero crossing as well as your snap. So this will allow you to, when you cut an audio file, that it's only going to be at the zero crossing to eliminate pops and clicks. So that when you make a cut, it would be like here as opposed to in here where you could maybe hear a click. Uh, we could choose different grid types as well as bars and your quantize information. And once you go over here, there's your quantize panel, uh, audio alignment, and doing different zones. So it's some of the stuff that's on the top as well. See, Ted Springman's been selling hardware to buy software. That's probably a good investment. Okay, so you see a question. Uh, with Cubase 11 Pro, Windows 10, do I need to use the license key USB all the time or only when downloading? Uh, can it be saved to my PC? So with Cubase 11 Pro, you would need to have the USB E licensor connected to the computer while it's running. You may be able to disconnect it, but as you do different functions, it would look for the license on a key. And if it's not there, you'll get a message. So generally, uh, just have it connected to your computer. And Cubase Elements and Under can run either on a USB e licensor or with the soft e licensor. And Cubase Artist and Cubase Pro need the hardware USB e licensor. Okay, so I just see, uh, uh, hi there, Greg. Can you please look into the issue of faders not pinning for instrument tracks? Thanks in advance. So maybe if you could give a little more information, I'm not sure what you mean by faders not pinning. So if you could give a little more information. Let's see, Michael Teams, thank me for my base contributions to the Hot Mess Records. It was a lot of fun to do. Thanks, Michael, for letting me play. All right, so I see we're at 99 likes. Maybe we'll get one more like so we get 100 before we migrate to our Zoom session. All right, so when is Cubase going dongle free? It's a pain on my MacBook Pro. Great stream, by the way. So um, I think we may see, you know, they've announced that it will be coming in the future. Uh, they haven't given more information. They just wanted to make sure that everyone was kind of aware of the change coming. So, you know, maybe for the next version, I don't know exactly, but you know, I just have, I'm running everything on my MacBook pro with, you know, three audio interfaces. So I just have a hub, you know, so it's not too bad. Okay, so we have a question from Chris Harrison. Is there a way to split stereo mixer channels into separate mono in the mixer? I'm using MPC software in Cubase and the outputs are stereo only, but I'm sending mono tracks, so I'm forced to pan them. Um, 
All right, and says in the outs on the mixer, would would like to find a way to have the outs be 32 mono so I can mix them properly. So it really depends on your configuration. So if you go to your VS, your audio connections, and if you add your outputs here, you could just simply add, you know, 32 mono outs if you want. And so say, I just want this to be 32 mono outs. You could do that. Um, so a lot of times when you're using a software instrument, the instrument itself defines the configuration for the outputs. Uh, so if that's the case, it's really kind of up to the instrument design. If it's going to just do a stereo output, if it's you have a stereo track that has been, um, you know, that you need to split. So right now, if I come here, I have a stereo track. And if I needed to split this, what I could do is, you know, if I just select the track, you could go to uh, your edit menu or project menu rather, and just choose to convert tracks. Uh, and then you could just say, you know, multi-channel to mono. And then you could just have two mono tracks uh, split out just like that. But if it's a virtual instrument and it's set to actually work as a stereo output, that's how it works, Chris. But you could configure your outputs to court, you know, to whatever channel configurations that you want. I know we had a question or two that were mailed in. Let's see if we can get to those. Um, all right, so we had a question. How to hide multiple open plugin windows at once? So let's say if I'm here and I have a number of plugin windows that are currently open and I wanted to just be able to close all of these plugin windows kind of in one fell swoop. We could actually go to Windows menu, and then from here we could actually just uh, choose Close All Plugin Windows, and that will allow you to kind of hide all the plugin windows as well. So I had a question mailed in. Hi, Greg, is there a way to trigger the chord pads with a MIDI track rather than a keyboard? Uh, I have fat fingers and bad timekeeping. So, you know, if you are doing the chord pads here, so say if we just go to, uh, I'll jump to another project here that was kind of set up for this. So, you know, we can think of the chord pads as being more of a MIDI controller, so it doesn't have a sound or really receive, like, you know, MIDI performance information, really. So let's say if I have, uh, like, my chord pad set up here for my electric piano. So I will just come listen. So, but, you know, but if you want it to just transmit uh, and record, really all you have to do is, you know, you could just set up all MIDI inputs or just from the chord pad. So if you have, you know, if your keyboard skills are really bad, you could probably just. And if you put this into record, you say, okay, let's just play. And I'll just solo this track here. And as I play the chords and just trigger them right from clicking on with the mouse, that all of those chords have been recorded as if I, you know, and I didn't have to use a MIDI controller for that. Okay, and then we had kind of a follow up again to uh, crossfade being grayed out. So let's say if I have you know, and we talked about this in the last live stream. So let's say, you know, and and there's kind enough to send a video, but let's say if I have a scenario, like, you know, if I wanted to take this part and crossfade, that when we go to our audio menu, I can see crossfade exist and I could crossfade accordingly. 
Uh, and in the message, they said that when they did this, that, you know, when they reset preferences. But the one thing I would check is if you have glued events together. So once we glue events together, and I try to now crossfade these, I think if we go to audio now, our crossfade is grayed out because these are audio events. So try to select the events if your audio crossfade isn't showing up as an option when you think it should, like the events are overlapping. Uh, try to select those two events and make sure that both events, um, you may have to just choose to from your audio menu to dissolve parts. And now once you dissolve the parts, uh, that the audio crossfade option will show up. So if you've like cut and glued events that might take the event and turn it into a part, and it's kind of, you know, it could be a little odd differentiation, but make sure that that particular part, that you don't have a part that you're trying to crossfade into. All right, let's go back to our live stream. Um, so I just see, hey, Greg, as a suggestion, every so often when you're reading out questions, can you say the time it was posted to? Not every read question, but maybe every 20 minutes or so to help follow the queue. So I don't see the actual time on the when a question was asked. Um, it's a, I, I could look into it and see, but when I look at it in the chat field and I'm behind, I don't see the time. So I don't know if I could do that. All right, so we just see uh, some string libraries have uneven sampling lags. Even after quantizing, they still don't sound perfect. Anything we can do about that? So I know what many composers end up doing is they know that this library needs to have, you know, 20 mil of playback, you know, or 20 milliseconds before the note kind of sounds where you think it should, or this one is six milliseconds. And many people have kind of just, you know, rendered a file, compared it with the MIDI uh, and to figure out exactly, okay, you know, I expect the MIDI to sound here, but it's six milliseconds late. And then just taking the particular MIDI, and once you know what that is within their template, you can see kind of the track delay. And then kind of, you know, just coming here and what you have is you could adjust the track delay in milliseconds here for each of the particular tracks. And once they have that kind of figured out once, they just leave that within their template so that when they, you know, quantize everything that, you know, where they expect the start note to be will actually be where the start note sounds. So give that a shot. All right, so we see Jeff Sabelski is going to be definitely reviewing the stream again. So that's great. Um, all right, so I just see from Jared Davis uh, with MIDI modifiers. If I have a straight sixteenth pattern and use length randomize along with density. It plays bursts of 16th notes. Is it possible to randomize note timing? Uh, example, eighths and and quarter notes, etc. So, um, so I, I don't know of a way. I'll just take a quick look uh, to just have it automatically go. You know, I let's take a look uh, just in the MIDI modifiers here. So, and it may also be like if you go into lengths, like if you're in the MIDI editor, um, 
you know, there's, you might be able to, uh, I guess that may not do what you want. So I think it's going to be kind of as you describe, but not like a mixture of quarter notes and eighth notes. But let me just take another look at it here. So let's just say we're going to choose our length. Um, you might be able to, and I probably don't have time to really do it here, but maybe if we choose uh, the length in multiple random parameters and set the minim minimum and maximum to different values, that that might kind of uh you might be able to kind of toggle between different rhythmic values there you see tim weinheim tim weinheimers is upset that someone disliked the stream today all right i think agent k said someone was upside down when they hit the like button so but that's okay i used to always get one person that disliked the stream before it even started so All right, um, let's see, we have just like another minute or two before we migrate over to the Zoom. So I hope everyone can make it over to the Zoom. All right, so we see David M. All right. All right, uh, so we have from Wickham Sky. Hey Greg, can you explain quick controls? My Nectar Pacer MIDI foot controller stopped working properly with since um, uh, 1A Pro update. Um, so it could be that the, you know, if your foot controller maybe was affected, so let's come over here and go to your studio setup and we will, so say if we have our VST quick controls, you know, check to make sure A, that the MIDI ports are gonna be set up here. And it could be that maybe you have a, uh, like the MIDI port, the MIDI message for your foot controller. I've seen this happen where someone hit the, if you hit the learn button and you hit the foot controller while that was open, it may have been captured as either a track quick control or a VST quick controls. So just make sure that you look through all of, you know, when you come over here that these controllers, that one of them isn't like your foot controller. Uh, and then try to reassign that. And then I think you'll be able to get your foot controller back. Otherwise it could be kind of usurped by the uh, quick control routings that you've done. All right, so I just see from uh, uh, it says, I like the dongle over Ethernet. That's class. However, I read a uh, press release saying Steinberger is scrapping the dongle for Cubase. Is that incorrect? So, yeah, Steinberg will be moving away from a physical protection device for the license management. All right. All right, I was just kind of scrolling back. I saw a quick question uh, from Paul Claridge. Uh, okay, um, all right, and now my chat field is, hang on just a second, let me just. Okay, so I just see, um, 
All right, just from uh, Paul Claridge, and it just says, I think uh, I think he wanted to know how to get the actual MIDI data generated when using an ARP on a track, maybe an arpeggiator. So, all right, so we'll show that. So thanks for, uh, for helping Paul. All right, so if we wanted to, let's say I have an electric piano part, and I have this set up for uh, a MIDI insert, like an arpeggiator. So I'll just come here and go to Arpache. So let's say I'll just come over here. All right, so let's say I have this pattern going on. All right, and if I wanted to actually just record that, you know, so I, I'll come over here. Okay, so all you have to do is you see this little record icon, and then as you just kind of hit play. So once you've done that, instead of just uh, playing the chord progression, it'll now take that chord progression and just simply kind of map it out. So just on, just make sure you have that enabled right there, and then that will record the arpeggio. All right, so I think we're just about at time to migrate over to the Zoom. I'm a little late. So I will just kind of hang out here. I'm gonna post uh, the link one more time. And maybe if I'll go ahead and start our start to zoom. All right, so I'm gonna post a link one more time and everyone that can make it over for the Zoom meetup, that'd be great to see everyone. But I'll go ahead and start the Zoom and we'll and we'll wrap up the uh, Cubase live stream here quickly. So I hope a lot of people can make it over. All right, so we'll, all right, we'll, all right, so I see some people migrating over. Looking forward to seeing everyone that could join the Zoom. All right, so. All right, so some more people and. All right. I'll just mute my microphone on the Zoom for now. So I don't have an infinite feedback loop between All right, and we'll again we'll be doing the live stream again on Friday. All right, and I'll just post it the link one more time here. Hey. All right, hey, Kevin. All right. I'll be wrapping up the uh, live stream here in just a minute. We have more people. Mm -hmm. I'll be there in just, I'll be on in just a minute here.
Okay. All right, so I will go ahead and end the live stream and Hey, Michael Teens, or <laughs> all right, so I'm going to end the live stream and everyone hopefully can make it over to the Zoom.